Hello to everyone, Saha Chufwa Megan Baker, and I'm a research associate in the Historic Preservation Department. Um, welcome back to Chata Chisholi. It's been a while <laughs> since we've been had a chance to kind of host this, um, but we're so delighted to kind of bring it back uh, to hear a presentation from Dr. Arlen Hansen, who recently um, received his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He's now a lecturer at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, and he's actually gonna be kind of sharing his dissertation and the research that he did um, on Choctaw removal. And so that's what he's gonna be sharing with us today. To you, Arlen. Uh, Holly Toe, uh, so I'm on? Okay, uh, let me share my um, screen here, a little bit of PowerPoint um, as we go. All right, and whoops. All right, there we go. That is not where I wanna be. Back it up, there we go. So uh, first, before I get started, I want to thank uh, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and uh, the Historic Preservation uh, Department and Ian and Megan for this uh, invitation to share uh, with this share today. Um, it's an honor and uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to uh, collaborate with the Historic Preservation Office uh, on this research. Uh, there have been several folks there who've greatly helped and contributed uh, to the research at points along the way. In addition to Megan and Ian, there's also been Deanna Bird, Misty Madbull, uh, Sandra Riley, and Ryan Spring, and I'm deeply uh, grateful to you all. So the name of the dissertation, uh, soon to be a book, uh, I hope, um, is Troubled Voices, Choctaws in Mass Deportation and Ethnic Cleansing. And I will get into the significance of that title and who these five individuals you're looking at are in just a moment here. And uh, many of you uh, Choctaws who may be uh, watching this uh, already recognize um, these individuals and know who they are, but I will get into that in a bit. But first, uh, I want to start here at Nanawaya. So this is where it all begins for the Choctaws. Um, Nanawaya, the mother mound of the Choctaws. And this is where I begin um, the dissertation. So the first three chapters cover a broad sweep of Choctaw history all the way from Nanawaya up to the um, signing of the removal treaty, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek in 1830. So starting in Naniwaya with the um, origin stories of the Choctaws, both the uh, migration stories, there are several versions of each of these that, that one can find. Uh, the, the migration stories where the brothers uh, uh, Chata and Chikaza come from the West with the pole, uh, and then the uh, creation story uh, there at Naniwaya, both the one where uh, the Chatas come straight out of the mound, um, or also the version where they come out of a cave, uh, which is very nearby to the Naniwaya mound. But starting there, uh, I go all the way up to um, the signing of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek in 1830 and provide a broad uh, overview, overview. So let me tell you a little bit about how I came to this research as a non-Choctaw, a non-Indigenous person. So my first real exposure to uh, indigenous people and their history and culture was when I was living in South Dakota in the 1990s, when I became acquainted with the Lakota of the Standing Rock, Cheyenne River and Pine Ridge uh, reservations. 
And I began at that time to see that um, indigenous peoples had something very important to teach the world, really. Um, and I think uh, that um, it's not an overstatement for me to say that at that point in time, I began to realize that their way of being in the world uh, was very relevant, even crucial to our survival as uh, human beings and spoke to many of the crises and issues that we face as a society today. So to shorten the story, uh, the seeds were planted uh, way back in the 1990s. Uh, and they wouldn't grow and bear fruit uh, until uh, quite some time later. Fast forward to around 2012, 2013, I was living in North Carolina where I still reside. And uh, I decided to go back to graduate school to pursue a PhD in history. It had always kind of been a dream of mine that was unfulfilled. Uh, Life got in the way, or uh, I allowed life to get in the way. But anyway, I decided to go back and uh, get my PhD in history. So I enrolled in a master's program at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And I began working with my mentor, Dr. Greg O'Brien, who's been a guest on the Cha Tata Show Leave, uh, talking about his uh, research and writing in uh, revolutionary era Choctaw history. Um, and uh, being much more familiar with Northern tribes at the time, I did my master's work on the uh, Huron or Wendat um, and the Haudenosaunee in the mid 17th century in uh, what is now Ontario, Canada. And when I applied to the PhD program there at UNCG to keep going and I wanted to keep working with uh, Greg O'Brien, uh, he basically said to me, so if I'm gonna work with you at the PhD level, you've gotta come to the Southeast and you've got to work uh, on something to do with Southeastern peoples because that being his area of expertise, he said, I can't really advise you at the PhD level unless you're, you know, working on somewhere in the Southeast. And um, so that was fine with me. I'm always uh, wanting to broaden my uh, knowledge base. So I knew that I'd be working on um, studying a, a Southern or Southeastern indigenous people, but I didn't know which yet. And so then very early in um, my time as a new uh, PhD student, I was sitting in a graduate seminar uh, with Dr. O'Brien, and he made a sort of an aside comment that wasn't even, uh, I think, re really related that much to the topic that we were discussing in class. And it was a sort of a, by the way, uh, there's only been one book length treatment uh, done of Choctaw removal, specifically about Choctaw removal. You know, there's been a lot written on the Cherokee removal and other removals, but only one book length treatment on Choctaw removal, and that was written in 1970. And I think it's about time for an update. And a um, little bell went off inside my head, and I thought, hmm, I think maybe that will be my dissertation. Uh, so I went out and I bought that book promptly. And here it is, the cover. Uh, it was the removal of the Choctaw Indians by Arthur uh, DeRozier uh, Jr. And um, I read it. It's a fine work of scholarship, especially for its day. I don't have anything uh, negative really to say about Arthur DeRozier as a historian and a scholar, but being written, in 1970, it was before the uh, wider advent of ethno-historical methodologies, and I'll explain what I mean that by that in just a moment. And um, it's more of a political history, there's nothing wrong with that, that is focused on um, the words and actions of big white names. Guys like Andrew Jackson, of course, was the president at the time. Uh, John C. Calhoun, the Secretary of War. Thomas McKenney, the Superintendent of uh, Indian Affairs. And uh, it's not really giving any sort of Choctaw perspective on what happened to them uh, in um, removal. And so, um, I said, you know, there's got to be a, a, a different story here. The story that I uh, wanted to tell was a story that, as much as possible, if I could, came from the Choctaws themselves. And I didn't know if it was possible, 
but it was, and, and that's what I have uh, tried to do. I'll give you an example of um, what was up there. Oh, I missed these. I was supposed to be doing that. You can tell I'm, I'm uh, great with PowerPoint here. I'll give you an example of um, Derosier. Uh, so um, David Folsom, who's one of my main uh, characters, actually, I think if I were to count up, there's probably more words devoted to David Folsom in my dissertation than to any other single figure. But um, David Folsom, very important Choctaw leader of the time, absolutely crucial to understand him and his involvement uh, to, in my view, to understand a Choctaw removal. DeRosier mentions David Folsom only five times, I counted, in his book in any substantive way. Well, I have an entire chapter devoted to David Folsom and uh, many other references and mentions uh, throughout. And a similar um, difference as that would apply to all seven of the Choctaw leaders that uh, I profile in the work who I will talk about uh, individually here in some detail uh, in just a bit. So I thought this is certainly not the Choctaw removal story that needs to be told. Uh, there's got to be another story that needs to be told and the Choctaw's own story from their perspective, their voices, uh, and not merely a rehearsal of the political maneuverings of uh, white government officials. And so that's what I set out uh, to do in the dissertation. So let me talk about the title here uh, a little bit. Troubled Voices, uh, Choctaws in Mass Deportation and Ethnic Cleansing. So this is this work is a reexamination uh, of the removal of the Choctaws from Mississippi. And, um, you know, I use the word removal in the dissertation. Uh, it is the long historically accepted term for this era and for what happened to the tribes that lived east of the Mississippi. Uh, but I make um, it very clear in my introduction that removal is an inadequate word. And of course, I'm not the only historian uh, who says that. Um, removal is a very inadequate word. And even uh, the people who uh, both the supporters of removal at the time, as well as its opponents in Congress when the debate was going on uh, before the passage of the Indian Removal Act, uh, said, you know, this is a deceptive word for, for this, really. Because what we are talking about is the massportation and the ethnic cleansing of an entire uh, people group. Now, of course, the word ethnic cleansing was not coined at that time. Uh, it didn't have its origin until the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s. But it applies. It, it is what happened to the Indians from east of the uh, Mississippi, who were more or less, more than less, forcibly uh, removed from their traditional lands and moved west of the uh, Mississippi. So yes, I do use the word removal and I will use it in this presentation for reasons of ease and because it is the historically used term, but uh, make no mistake, uh, it um, is, a rather innocuous word for what actually uh, occurred here. So that's the subtitle. Uh, the title, Troubled Voices, comes from the fact that when I started out, I said, I wanna try to tell this story from Choctaw perspective, through Choctaw voices, not just through government documents, not just through uh, a rehearsal of what's already been told of what the federal government did, what the state of Mississippi did, and as it turns out, uh, I identified um, seven um, really crucial, important Choctaw leaders. There's only five of them uh, pictured here. Uh, from left to right, we have David Folsom, Michelle Tubby, Peter Pitchlin, Greenwood LaFleur, and George Harkins. The two that are not pictured are Nitiketchi and James McDonald. 
Uh, Nitakechi, I have yet to find um, a image of him anywhere that, that I can really identify is actually an image of Nitakechi. I'm not sure that one exists. And James McDonald, I've only ever found one, and I was unable to relocate that uh, image for this, so uh, that's why he is not pictured. But these seven individuals were crucially important leaders uh, during the period from about 1818 to 1834, and I will um, discuss the uh, importance of those dates uh, in just uh, a moment. And it turns out that most of these uh, leaders left behind voluminous correspondence that could be mined. Uh, it's correspondence to each other. It's correspondence to government officials. It's, uh, in some cases, newspaper editorials um, and uh, open letters to the American people in some cases. Uh, and we're able to retrieve uh, what they thought was actually going on, their struggles, their motivations, uh, what they thought of each other, their conflicts with each other, and even in some states, such as some cases, such as uh, uh, the correspondence of David Folsom, I would uh, contend that we can actually uh, access what their state of mind uh, was, and and James McDonald too their state of mind was during many of these years leading up to and into the removal years of the early 1830s. Uh, so these voices, these Choctaw voices, we find are extremely troubled. These uh, leaders were under um, Great pressure through the decade of the 1820s. The 1820s is a decade of um, immense turmoil in the Choctaw Nation as the pressure just continues to mount and mount and mount and mount from the state of Mississippi and from the federal government. They are badgered uh, again and again and again for new treaty uh, negotiations. Uh, on a couple of occasions, they're able to stave those off and refuse. Most of the time, they cannot and uh, they have to sign additional treaties. Each one of these chips away at the Choctaw land base there in what is now the state of Mississippi, and eventually it will come to the point in um, 1830 when uh, it will all be over and the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek will be signed and the Trail of Tears and Death will then begin. So all of these uh, Choctaw leaders are under immense pressure during the 1820s. They try resistance, uh, and um, I think it's crucially important to understand what was going on with them and to hear their voices in order to get a real Choctaw perspective and understanding of what happened with um, removal. Uh, so that's where the term troubled voices comes from, because as you read their correspondence uh, and all of their writings, uh, that is what emerges, that they are troubled, conflicted uh, individuals who are under immense pressure during the uh, crucial decade of the 1820s. So um, let's look a little bit at uh, them individually david fulsom um he is uh an evangelical christian he's uh very much a friend to missionaries uh a lot of his correspondence is with missionaries to whom he had a very close uh friendships and um michelle tubby uh he is him and nitakechi who is not pictured here are representatives of a sort of an older order of a Choctaw polity, of uh, the way the Choctaws um, came to their uh, chiefs and uh, the way that their uh, nation was uh, sort of managed. Uh, and they are being at this time sort of replaced by some of these younger leaders, such as David Folsom and Greenwood LaFleur. A new generation of is coming to power who has very different ideas about what's going on. And so there's tremendous conflict 
in the Choctaw Nation uh, during the 1820s. A lot of these men will separate into different camps. They will come almost to blows with each other. There are two occasions during the 1820s when the Choctaw Nation comes to the very brink of civil war uh, with each other. In particular, uh, it is usually uh, David Folsom and Greenwood LaFleur together against Michelle Tubby and Nittakechi twice, both in 1826 and in 1829. Um, they will almost come to war, uh, but will manage to, uh, through diplomacy, uh, stave that off. Uh, David Folsom and Nittakechi will be largely responsible for that. Uh, Greenwood LaFleur, I talk about him a lot in this dissertation. He is a very controversial figure, as some of you may know, in the removal story. And I try to sort out his legacy and decide what was really happening with Greenwood LaFleur. George Harkins, his nephew, of course, and his successor, who at one point in time writes a letter basically accusing his uncle Greenwood of treason uh, against the Choctaw Nation, that he sold the Choctaw Nation out. Uh, and so it's a very complicated, messy situation that's going on here within the Choctaw leadership in the 1820s. And uh, through their correspondences, what they say to each other, what they say to outsiders, to uh, government officials, I make an attempt in several chapters to sort through that and to tell the story of the tumultuous decade of the uh, 1820s through their uh, words. Um, so that's not all there is though. If all I focused on was just these individuals, then there could be the um, accusation and actually some people have said this to me that, well, you know, these are elites uh, among the Choctaws. Uh, what about the rest of the Choctaws, the ordinary uh, Choctaws who were not, uh, in, in many, most cases here, the people you're looking at were very wealthy. Uh, some of them owned slaves, actually, and um, uh, they participated in uh, commercial ventures and plantation agriculture and things like that. They could be considered elites within the Choctaw Nation. What about the ordinary Choctaws? Well, re retrieving their voices is not as easy. It's much more difficult because they didn't leave behind uh, voluminous correspondence as uh, these other individuals did. But what I was able to do um, is uh, when I got to the last chapter, the last chapter deals with the trail of tears and death. And of course, as some of you may know, that phrase originates, it's been used a lot uh, talking about Cherokee removal. Most of the time when you hear the phrase trail of tears, people are talking about the Cherokees um, because much more has been written about them. But as uh, many of you may know, the the original phrase was the trail of tears and death and that it originates with the Choctaws who, whose removal started six years before the uh, Cherokees. It was the first removal after the signing of the uh, Indian Removal Act. And so uh, through these individuals, I tell the story of that crucial decade of the 1820s. But when we get to 1830, and the trail of tears and death begins. Yes, I still talk about some of their stories, but I wanted to uh, try to retrieve the stories of what it was like for ordinary Choctaws on the trail of tears and death. And to do that, I accessed what is known as the Indian Pioneer Papers from the Western History Collections at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, these are not eyewitness accounts um, because most of these were taken by Works Progress Administration uh, ethnographers during the uh, FDR administration, mostly in, in 1937. They're oral interviews and they are with either children or grandchildren 
of uh, Choctaws who came over from Mississippi to Indian Territory, now the state of Oklahoma, on the Trail of Tears and uh, Death. So they're not firsthand accounts, but still we can glean a lot from them about what the trail was, about the horrors of the trail, um, the winter weather, the, the sickness, the death in, in huge numbers, the cholera, uh, all of these things that they faced on the Trail of Tears and Death from the stories that those who came over told to their children and to their grandchildren. So those are all here at the um, Indian Pioneer Papers uh, in the Western History Collections of the University of Oklahoma, and I've accessed those quite a bit in my uh, last chapter. There's also a section in that chapter where uh, I talk about the subject of uh, historical and generational trauma stemming from removal. Uh, when I first came to visit the Historic Preservation Office of the Choctaw Nation in 2018, and the folks that I talked to there, Deanna Bird being among them, one of the things that they conveyed to me that was their concern uh, in my attempting this project was that to convey that removal isn't really sort of ancient history. Uh, it's, uh, it's still very much relevant today to many of the issues that the Choctaw Nation uh, faces. And so they uh, wanted me to uh, get into this issue and that's why I did so. Uh, in that part of my uh, final chapter. Now, that's a very quick um, overview of the work. Uh, I've left out a lot, uh, but that I think I've hit the main points there. But before I uh, end, um, I want to go back to Nanawaya, and I want to read to you the epilogue of the dissertation. It's just a couple of pages, so it won't take very long. Um, because the story that is told here is, I think, a very poignant and powerful one, and I think really encapsulates the tone of what I was attempting uh, with this work. So, as we look at um, Nanawaya and Peter Pitchlin, who this epilogue mainly concerns, uh, let me read this to you. In 1831, Peter Pitchlin led one of the first removal groups to Indian Territory. Fifteen years later, in 1846, Pitchlin made a trip back to Mississippi. It was a trip full of memories and poignant emotion for him. In letters to one of his brothers and to the tribal attorney, John M. Armstrong, Pitchlin remembered, quote, Here I killed an alligator. There I killed a deer. Here I slept one night. And there was the spot my horse fell when I was bounding through the woods at full speed. End of quote. Pitchlin visited the family graveyard and went back to the family home to find it now occupied by a white family. Much had changed, even in the landscape, in 15 years. Gone were the clusters of river cane and tall oaks at his old fishing spots. There was now far more land in cotton fields worked by hundreds more slaves. Quote, this was once a healthy country, wrote Pitchlin, but now it is a very sickly one. I scarcely know of any of the places that were once familiar to me, end of quote. Then finally, Pitchlin visited Nanawaya. Climbing to the summit, Pitchland imagined generations of his kin, 
and remembered the ancient origin stories of his people. And he was comforted. Nanawaya is central. It may truly be called the mother mound of the Choctaws. I began this work in chapter one with the assertion that one cannot make full sense of the Choctaw experience of removal without starting at Nanawaya and with the Choctaw's rootedness and sense of place. It is the echo of this rootedness to place that is heard in David Folsom's angry plea to William Ward, agent to the Choctaws. Quote, but here is our home, our dwelling places, our fields, our schools, all our friends, and under us, the dust, the bones of our forefathers. This land is dearer to us than any other. Why talk to us about removing? End of quote. The Choctaw homeland, where they had been from time immemorial, provided not only familiarity of sustenance and livelihood, but even more crucially, spiritual connection, rootedness, and spiritual sustenance as well. For the Choctaws then, removal was a brutal severance from this rootedness, sustenance, and spiritual connection. As the historian Tim Allen Garrison has put it, removal was not just about, quote, an exile to a faraway land, end of quote. In the loss of the homeland, a wound was opened, a wound of personal, cultural, and spiritual identity. This work started at Naniwaya, and here it ends at Naniwaya. It started with the Choctaw origins at Naniwaya, and here it ends with a saddened, yet comforted, Peter Pitchlin standing atop the mother mound and looking back across the generations. That the Choctaw removal story is sad, even horrifying, is understatement. Yet, in the sweep of history, the more important story may be that of resilience. Nanawaya still stands, as does the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, the Mississippi Band of Choctaws, and the smaller Jenna Band of Choctaws of Louisiana. Whether removed or unremoved, the Choctaws have remained. Chata Ahaya Moma. And uh, that translates into English as many Choctaw standing. And uh, that concludes the PowerPoint part of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Arlen. I appreciate the opportunity to learn more about your research and really kind of the methodology behind it and its kind of significance and how you kind of put it within the larger scholarship, because I think um, it's true. Um, a lot of the stuff about removal is really old stuff, even like the Oklahoma histories. Sure. The ones that we have now, not that many <laughs> were written post 2000. And I think we found a lot of materials um, that haven't even ever really kind of been utilized. Um, and so it was really kind of great to hear someone else kind of doing that for an earlier period. Um, so thank you so much for that, Yakoki. Um, so now we're gonna kind of turn to our question and answer kind of question mm -hmm. of today. Um, so if you guys are watching, feel free to, if you had any questions um, about um, removal or anything that he kind of had, um, anything he presented on, you can um, put your questions in the chat or the question and answer, or you can send me a private message and I'll see that. Um, but for now, I have um, some questions already prepared. Um, Dr. Ian Thompson was supposed to be in conversation with Arlen. Um, Dr. Thompson, who works for, our, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, was on um, Dr. Hansen's dissertation committee. So he read it as Arlen was kind of working on it and gave him lots of feedback and so, um, that was pretty awesome. And it's actually kind of pretty rare. Not a lot of people who get their dissertations have people from the community on their kind of dissertation committees. And if you guys don't know how that kind of works, it's just like a group of scholars who kind of make sure everything's kind of right and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're writing a dissertation. So it was really cool. 
Yeah, um, may, I may I just uh, uh, jump in there and say that it was um, it was crucially important to me that I mean I don't think especially a, a, a non-indigenous person should be doing uh, research into indigenous history if they're not talking and collaborating with the people who they are writing and and researching about. And so it was crucial to me from the get-go to uh, to do that. And um, it was uh, it was outstanding uh, I, to have Dr. Thompson on my committee and um, uh, it, it wouldn't have been anything like uh, the work that it turned out to be if it hadn't been for him, so. Yeah, if you're writing a history from the perspective of indigenous peoples, it's really important to have contemporary indigenous people also in it, right? Because Absolutely. we are their kind of descendants and we live with the legacies right. of their decisions. Like whatever happened, it's like we are kind of what comes after it and kind of we were that kind of the people that they thought of when they made the decisions that they made of um, yeah. during removal. Um, so I actually kind of really wanted to um, hear more about um, other parts of the collaborative process. Like, um, could you make, I, cause I could see it in your footnotes as I was reading it, but would you like to kind of like draw it out um, for people who did not have the opportunity to read your dissertation, what it was like to like work with Ian? Um, he was, so I would, uh, you know, as you probably know, you're, you're doing a PhD. Um, it can get to be a pretty lonely, uh, endeavor. You're in archives, you're doing research, you're, you're sitting in front of your computer, uh, writing, you're sorting through your research and documents and um, you, you pretty much do all of that stuff by yourself and you do it for years, <laughs> you know. Um, so with with Dr. Thompson, uh, from time to time, I, I would um, come across um, stuff that, wow, I, um, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and I need I need uh, an indigenous perspective on this. I need a Choctaw perspective to to help me sort through this. So he was able to put a lot of things in a in in a context of knowing, um, I guess Choctaw ethnography and culture, <laughs> absolutely far better than I uh, ever uh, would. And um, it's stuff that I would have missed you know, as a non uh, Choctaw, non-Indigenous person. And he said, okay, like, for example, I'll just give you one example that comes to me off the top of my head, the, the term white path, when it's used uh, in some of the correspondence. And um, my thought was, oh, well, what they're talking about is, is the civilization project and they want to become like the whites. And there is, there are in some cases that is what they're talking about. But what, but, but what um, Dr. Thompson pointed out to me was that that's actually a translation of, I believe, the Choctaw term is Hinahanta, which means the bright path, and it was a term that they used previous to contact the bright path to victory, and then uh, it sort of translated over, and they started calling the gospel when missionaries came. Uh, some Choctaw started calling that the white path or the bright path. So there's no way I ever would have known uh, something like that without the expertise of a, of a Choctaw anthropologist uh, on my committee. So that that's just a one example. So from time to time, uh, he, he, it didn't happen a lot, but he but I was able to ask him questions and he gave me important feedback. And then when I submitted my draft to him, uh, he gave me a few pages of um, criticisms and suggestions, um, et cetera, which uh, helped me to make some um, some really substantive uh, revisions to the work. So, and then also talking about the collaborative process, uh, there was an occasion where uh, when I went to the uh, Mississippi State University archives that had some documentation that I needed. Um, 
the Choctaw Preservation um, Office sent uh, Deanna Bird and Misty Madbull to to help me. Uh, they they helped me uh, do research there and sort through some documents, and so uh, that was uh, pretty amazing. And um, just everybody there at the office uh, has been um, very gracious to me, uh, and I I can't tell you how valuable the um, feeling supported by by actual Choctaw people has has been to me. It's it's um, it's priceless. So. Thanks. It's so exciting to see someone kind of do the work, right? We we kind of all know that there's so much kind of that still has to be done. So it's always really I'm always jazzed whenever I was like, oh, great. Another scholar working on this. Now we can really combat all the like bad narratives or the ones not from a Choctaw perspective. So if you're a young Choctaw out there wanting to do history, you know, you can always work with us. So I'll just throw that plug out <laughs> to people who want to be historians and know that you can work with kind of tribes. And I think you're a great example of like showing the potential of how like it's good for all kind of parties involved. Um, yeah, and I, um, there are folks um, in the PhD program that I came from um, who are doing indigenous history uh, who are not as far along in their programs as I am, who I have, um, I've, I've been like a huge proponent saying, you have got to go visit that tribe and you've got to talk to them. And I mean, you know, it just, you, you can't do this without that. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I would love to hear more about what was actually the most interesting parts in the dissertation for you. Like, what did you, like what parts of Choctaw history kind of captured your imagination the most? And then, what do you think our Choctaw community members uh, would be like? What was the best story that you kind of pulled and hadn't really seen um, that you think people would be interested in today? Well, one of the best stories was the one that I ended with there. Um, when I read that, and I actually got that, um, that's not her words, but but I actually found that story through Christina Snyder in, in her book, uh, Great Crossings. And then I went and looked up those letters and the actual documentation to tell that story myself. Because when I read it, I said, that's the end of my dissertation right there. That's, that's the ending. Uh, so, um, but... There are some amazing stories there in the 1820s. There's a story uh, that uh, Horatio Cushman tells in 1826, the first time that the um, Choctaw Nation almost comes to civil war when um, Mishola Tubby and Nittiketchee have about 700 uh, troops and uh, David Folsom and Greenwood the floor have about 800 to 1,000 troops, and they advance on each other, and uh, they're facing each other across a field, and they're ready to do battle. And uh, Nittiketchee uh, steps out and walks to the middle of the field, and then just stands there staring at David Folsom. And David Folsom doesn't know um, what the meaning of this is, but he thinks, well, maybe he wants me to come out and talk to him. So he uh takes a step and as soon as he takes a step uh according this is all according to Cushman the rifles of Nittiketchee and Michelle Tubby's men go up and as soon as that happens David Folsom hears behind him that all of his men their rifles have gone up and the the locks have clicked and he walks out to the middle and basically him and Nittiketchee have a talk and they are managed to defuse the situation. And when they shake hands, the rifles go down. Um, and then there's a story where a similar thing sort of happens in 1829, the second time that the nation almost comes to civil war. It's the same group, uh, Nittiketchee and Mishola Tubby and their followers versus uh, uh, Greenwood LaFleur and David Folsom and their followers. And that one, there's like four different versions. One of the versions has Michelle Tuppy hiding in a corn crib and then they tie him up. Uh, another one says, oh no, that's a lie. 
that uh, Michelle Atubby stood up to Greenwood LaFleur and Greenwood LaFleur backed down. Uh, and so I just give all four versions and say, I don't know how to sort this out, you know. Um, but the stories um, of the actual individuals and also some of the stories from the from the Trail of Tears, there's so many of them that are just so poignant and uh, and powerful. And that's one of the things that I didn't mention that I meant to mention is that the reason I wanted to do it this way is because for me, when I read things, I don't wanna just read a chronology of events. This happened and then that happened and then there was this legal case and then they signed this treaty. I mean, that's necessary information. And of course that's in my dissertation, but I want a human story. And so one of the things that I tried to do, especially with these seven individuals, is I wanted the reader to get to know them, to feel like they're invested in these characters, that they they know them and they know what these people are going through. And like, wow, I wouldn't have made the decision that he made just there, but he's under incredible pressure and I kind of understand, you know, where he's coming from. Um, and so, you know, I didn't talk in the presentation about James McDonald, but James McDonald is um, one of the most tragic figures. He was brilliant. He's the first Choctaw. He's the first Native American lawyer, the first Native American who has ever studied law and became uh, an attorney in history. And a brilliant, uh, eloquent person, uh, fighter against Choctaw removal. And the, he suffered for several years, it's, you can see it in his letters, from intense depression. Um, it's very well documented that he uh, struggled with alcohol. He was an alcoholic. And uh, he ends up being one of the signers of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. But uh, about a month later, his body is found washed up along the uh, shore of the Pearl River, just south of uh, Jackson. And the cause of death was never, uh, you know, determined. Uh, some accounts say that he committed suicide. Some accounts say that it was an unfortunate accident, but we don't know. But he meets a, uh, a tragic end. And um, I think that, you know, once this becomes a book and hopefully if, um, if people read it, and especially I, I would love that the Choctaws uh, read it, um, they'll be really touched as I was by the, the tragic story of um, James McDonald. And through the stories that I tell of these different individuals, I hope that their personalities, you know, have come through. Uh, Peter Pitchlin's uh, an interesting uh, personality. There are stories about when he goes on uh, trips to the West that, you know, he's dancing with uh, Osage girls and he wants to marry one of them, even though he's already married uh, back uh, in uh, Mississippi. His wife is back there taking care of the the farm and um, he's quite a he's quite a comes off as kind of kind of a quite a party animal in some ways. Um, so they're all different uh, personalities and that's what I wanted to try to convey and their struggles as they kind of led their people uh, through this time. So. Yeah, these people had such rich kind of lives. And I think we Choctaws are really lucky because we had learned English so early on because a lot of our leaders were educated. So they wrote all of these kinds of things. Yeah. So we are really lucky that we kind of get this insight, um, into these individuals. Yeah. So I'm so oh, glad. And, and, um, <laughs> also, but the stories from the, the Indian Pioneer Papers, um, there's one, it's it's actually one of the stories that's not told from, from one of the Choctaw uh, descendants, but it's a story that uh, comes from uh, one of the agents that was leading a removal party. And he talks about how there's this ancient headman, I think his name is Etahoma, that's close if not exactly it, but um, he he's struggling to keep up with the party and uh basically you know the the choctaw agent is trying to get them to um make a certain amount of progress every day and they say you know we're not going on without him uh we love him and so he they basically stopped the whole um 
or slow down the whole party of several hundred Choctaws because because their 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 aged chief uh, can't keep up, uh, and so there's there's all kinds of stories like that that just show the um, the real that we're talking about human beings here, you know, with with families and who and and that that have emotions and love people and and uh, that are like everybody else, you know, and and this is what happened uh, to them, so. Um, so what, um, so how, as you were kind of going through this, um, you know, Choctaw women figure very importantly in decision making. And so I'd love to hear more about like, how can you find a female voice with the, um, about the Trail of Tears, um, when they're actually not really kind of there in the actual documentation? Well, um, actually that is the one place and I do mention this in my introduction, how uh, through most of the dissertation, it's a men's story. That's a sad artifact of the documentary uh, base that um, that's what we have, even though, of course, women are in some ways, I'd say much more important in Choctaw society than they are in European society at this time. They, they're decision makers. They're, they're the farmers, of course. They, uh, they are credited with the power to, you know, give life because that's connected with, with a farming as well. That they're, they're crucially important. And yet we don't have their voices in the documentary record until we get to those Indian pioneer stories and actually most of the stories that are told in that compilation about the Trail of Tears uh, are told by women who were um, granddaughters and, and uh, daughters of, of people who were moved. And, and so women do appear because they talk about what their mothers went through and things like that, their grandmothers. Women do appear in the last chapter more so than at any other point in the dissertation, but unfortunately, um, there aren't as many women in this work as I would like there to be, and and I acknowledge uh, that. So. Uh, so what? In what ways um, did gaining access to a Choctaw account of the Treaty of um, Dancing Rabbit Creek change your perception of the Choctaws, of Choctaw leaders later in your research? Um, it made me go a little easier on them <laughs> uh, because um, more so than you get through the journals of the treaty commissioners and even uh, historians much closer to the fact, people like Cushman and, and, and Halbert uh, who talk about it, um, you find that, um, you know, while they weren't escorted really at gunpoint as the late Cherokee removals were, this was not, you can't say in any way, shape or form that this was a voluntary uh, thing. This, this, was, uh, this was absolutely forced uh, upon them. They, had, they really didn't have any other choice uh, backed against the wall as they were uh, at Dancing Rabbit Creek. And, and these are all individuals. And of course, the lone exception that I talk about in my my uh, dissertation. He's a very controversial figure. I know that there's a lot of opinions on him. May, may be Greenwood LaFleur. But all of these other individuals, you know, um, they, they had resisted right up until that treaty negotiation at Dancing Rabbit Creek in 1830. And uh, I think they got to a point where they just saw it, it, it they couldn't do it anymore. And uh, they said, you know, let's, instead, we have to try to get the best deal that we can here because uh, it's inevitable. We are, we are being threatened with uh, military, we're being threatened with war here. 
uh, basically. So. Um, so how do you think research on this time period and the Trail of Tears um, kind of more broadly can inform our understanding of the 21st century? The 21st century? Yeah, so how does this history ah. kind of come into the present, do you think? Okay, I gotta think about that for a sec. Um, because I try not to be, um, as, as an early American historian, I, I try not to uh, be presentist too much. Uh, but, I mean, certainly, to, to, to some extent, um, the issues that motivated um, Indian removal are, are still with us in different forms today. One of the things that I say, uh, I make very clear at several points in my dissertation is that and this doesn't just apply to the Choctaws, it, it applies in, in, in my view to all native peoples, all indigenous peoples in North America and probably throughout the world as well, that the conflicts between them and um, Anglo-Europeans have basically always come down to the land. Um, and you still see that today with the struggles out at Oak Flat uh, in Arizona with the with the Apache. You see it at Standing Rock. Um, I see it here in North Carolina with uh, some of the tribes, uh, folks that I know from the uh, Okanichi Saponi Nation here who are who are standing against uh, certain pipelines that would come into and through this state and and pollute the watershed. Um, it comes back to the land and indigenous um, peoples having an idea about stewarding the land, whereas the Anglo-American view still seems to be largely that the land is commodities to be uh, exploited. So that is still with us today. Of course, the, the racial issues that also to some extent uh, motivated um, Removal are are still uh, with us uh, today, and um, so yeah, these things uh, haven't gone away, and that's why studying history, you know, if we want to understand the present and what may be the future, that's why history is important. <laughs> definitely, definitely, an ongoing kind of problem. Yeah. Um, um, so what what are your plans kind of for the future with this? Do you see any future collaborations with Choctaw Nation? I would absolutely love, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but I would absolutely love to collaborate with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and with your office there uh, in some further uh, ways. Uh, absolutely. Um, and whatever... Um, Indigenous history I do going forward, um, I absolutely plan on on collaboration. So, but at this point, um, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> and um, so I don't I don't really know <laughs> exactly what, what the future uh, is going to bring. <laughs> Once you get the job, it'll all kind of fall in place. I'm sure <laughs> we'll see. I hope so. <laughs> the academic market is wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so now I'm going to transition into some questions from our audience members. Okay. Um, we have one from a Miss Anita Marshall. She, ac um, she asks, um, what are your thoughts on framing post removal through resilience versus um, reconciliation or restoration? How does that influence how we continue um, to deal with the fallout from removal? Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I haven't given a tremendous amount of thought to the issue of reconciliation. I, I do give a lot of thought to the issue of resilience. Now, when I teach uh, Native American history, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I tell my students and one of the things that I try to do is, you know, this there's a lot of um, horrible stuff that you're going to learn here, stuff that's going to shock you. Um, and, uh, but one thing that I don't want to do is just portray native peoples as uh, victims, because the bigger story is that 
they're all still here and they are resurgent and they are resilient and they have and are reclaiming their cultures and their languages, uh, et cetera. So that's a story that needs to be told as well. So I, I have focused a lot in my teaching and, and also you know, what I read there, the epilogue to my dissertation speaks to that as well on the issue of resilience. For me, any reconciliation that comes, it has to start um, on an individual level, I think. And I guess what I see as my role as a, as a professor, as a teacher, is that um, you can't really address this uh, wound of the past that's kind of a part of our national DNA until you know about it. And once you know about it, then you can start asking questions. Okay, well, what do I, as a non-Indigenous person who now lives on what I know to be stolen land, uh, and with this uh, in our past as a nation, what do I do about that? And what is my response to that? And uh, until that happens, I think a lot more than, than it already has, I don't know that we're going to have any kind of um, anything more than, you know, individual reconciliations, anything more than a, uh, we won't have it on a large scale. That's my present thoughts about it. But as I said, I haven't honestly thought about the, uh, the uh, issue of reconciliation a lot. I can't hear you. A couple of people are asking, could they get a copy of your dissertation? Would that be possible for? Um... Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. Um, even as the author, if I want to order more copies, well, actually, you know, it's on ProQuest. So you could, uh, you could do a search for it. And I think there might be an option to purchase it, a PDF of it off of that. I'm not positive but that would be i guess that would be my recommendation recommendation is to search this title troubled voices choctaws and mass deportation ethnic cleansing on proquest and see if they could get a um a pdf of it because it is posted on there uh now yeah i think someone had asked me and that was kind of my suggestion for them i was like oh i'm pretty sure it's online like if you go to a public school they kind of make your um materials public and so you just yeah. kind of look it up and you can get a free pdf and that should be fine yeah but if i if i want to get hard copies of it even as the author they're they're not cheap <laughs> <laughs> PDF probably be the best until your book comes out and we're very right. excited can't wait for that to happen me me um, either <laughs> Um, awesome. Uh, another question, um, were there any letters that you found focusing on specific items like blankets, smithing materials that the tribe requested um, for the negotiation at the Treaty of James and Robert Creek? Or maybe even letters that discuss items that they would need um, once going westward? Uh, not so much letters, but there is a lot a lot of that sort of thing in all of the government documents, the uh, the journals, um, actually the document that they would want to look at, and it's it's online. You can search it up. Uh, it's got a longer title, but if you search document 512, uh, you will find uh, the entire um, correspondences of all of the government officials uh, from the time just before removal until, you know, the removals of the 1830s are over around like 1834-ish. It goes a little bit beyond that, but there's all kinds of requisitions in there and talks about, you know, they need this many blankets and they need this many rifles and they need this many wagons and where are we going to get the beef uh, that we're going to supply to them uh, and at what cost and through what vendors and things like that. And then there are also um, some of the uh, pleas in there from uh, Choctaws, Choctaw leaders saying, you know, we need this much of this uh, for the Trail of Tears. Also, 
that's often that that type of thing is often found in treaties, not just the land sessions, but also in the annuities. The annuity will be in cash, but it will also be in this many rifles, this many uh, blankets, this many suits of clothes. Uh, part of it will be in that uh, as well. So there's all kinds of that stuff, but I, I didn't find it so much in the letter base uh, of individuals that I was um, that I was accessing. Yeah, it also just says in the treaties themselves, like what right. it doesn't say the price precise amount, but they're kind of listed so you have a general idea of what people yep. want. Um, is there, um, since you know how much um, archival material there is on Choctaws, what are some areas that you think are kind of understudied of um, within that kind of existing record um, where people haven't looked at stuff as much? Um, I think a lot of the stuff that I looked at, well, that's not true. Um, certainly, um, certainly some of the historians that have, that I admire that have gone before me, people like James Taylor Carson and, uh, Christina Snyder and Greg O'Brien have looked at a lot of the same documentation I have, but, um, um, I think there are relatively few of us who have looked at at most of the Choctaw documentation that is out there. And there's certainly other dissertations that could be done. One that I thought of, I mean, um, um, Clara Sue Kidwell did a book called uh, Choctaws and Missionaries. Uh, and um, it's all about missionary activity but that that's another book that was written a long time ago and there could possibly be an update from a different uh, perspective because that is one of the uh, source bases that I didn't access thoroughly. Some of them I absolutely did, but the correspondence between missionaries and uh, people in the Choctaw Nation and also I accessed enough of it to tell the story that I wanted to tell, especially with David Folsom. But, uh, and the documents from the American Board of, um, the American Board of Christian Foreign Missions, I think it's called ABCFM in Massachusetts that sent most of the missionaries to the Choctaw Nation. They have all kinds, of course it's from, you have to understand that that documentation is, that's not from a Choctaw perspective. That's from a white perspective, the missionaries. So there's going to be a skew there. There's going to be a, a bias. But that's a, an, um, a huge uh, database that I don't think has been looked at um, very much. So. Awesome. Um, this is kind of because I had gotten to read a little bit of it, but I would love if you could tell our audience today a little bit more about the Panton Leslie Company um, and kind of their role. Um, in the early period, you know, the trading company, because um, um, I know some of our researchers, we've kind of been trying to learn a little bit more about that, and we would kind of love to hear what you kind of found about them and their relationship. Well, actually, I can't tell you a whole lot. Um, what I know about Panton and Leslie and their uh, relationship to the Choctaws is almost entirely the little tiny bit that I put in the dissertation. I know that uh, before um, in the in the early 1800s, say like the first couple of decades, probably pre 1820, uh, with the Choctaws, uh, they were trading with Panton and Leslie, which was a British firm based in Pensacola, Florida. Which up until 1821. Florida was not a part of the uh, United States. It had been a Spanish possession, and then it was a British possession. Uh, so in order to not deal with Americans, if they didn't want to deal with Americans, most of the time it was fine that they dealt with Americans, but if they didn't want to, they had to go down to Florida to still trade and deal with uh, the British. And so that was the uh, firm of Panton and Leslie and uh, especially in the 1810s, I believe it was, 
a number of Choctaw leaders, and I'm pretty sure Michelle Atabi among them, perhaps uh, Pushmataha as well, uh, accrued significant debt to the firm of Panton and Leslie. And as I stated in the dissertation at one point, the United States will use that uh, in one of the treaties. I forget which one it is this, at this point. It might be, it might be Mount Dexter, or it might be Hoboken and Tupa. It's one of the two, I think, where they'll basically go to Panton and Leslie and say, what does the Choctaw Nation owe you? Oh, it's this many thousand dollars. Okay, well, we'll pay that. And then they, they pay Panton and Leslie, the United States government does. And then um, they take the bills from Panton and Leslie and they present them to the uh, Choctaws and say, now you owe us this much money. We paid your debt for you. And the United States uses that as another way to put pressure on the Choctaws to cede land. That happens twice because after the first time that um, the United States pays off Panton and Leslie, uh, they, over the next decade, the, the Choctaws will go into debt to Panton and Leslie um, again. So other than that, uh, I don't know uh, a lot about anything about the history so much of Panton and Leslie. I just know they were there as a British trading concern in Pensacola, and this is how they figured into um, Indian removal. Yeah, I know. I, I just thought most people don't know about Panton and Leslie and kind of how private companies also, like, you know, worked with the U.S. Yeah. government to, kind of, to show kind of the relationship. Well, you know, at this point in time, uh, I think it was sometime in the 1790s, um, with the advent of the civilization plan, the United States uh, wouldn't let just independent traders go trade with the Indians anymore. They established government trading posts called factories, and everything was done through the United States government. Of course, Jefferson in 1803 will famously write to Governor William Henry Harrison and will say, you know, we're not gonna make a profit off the trading houses. We're gonna sell at cost, and we're going to sell cheap and we're going to get the Indians. He, he comes right out and says this. We're going to get the Indians in debt so that when we want another piece of land, basically, we'll go and say, um, you know, you're in all of this debt. Um, how about we forgive your debts and you give us this land? So that was Jefferson's strategy way back in 1803. This is 27 years before um, removal. So all of the U.S. trading concerns are government uh, affiliated and run at this time, but there's still this private company of Panton and Leslie down in Florida that they they can trade with at least at least for a while up until about 1820. Yeah, it's really crazy, and I just thought, well, not enough people know about this, so let's let's have him talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, uh, I'm certain there's a lot more. Um, uh, research that could be done on Pant Panton and Leslie, if anybody wanted to do it. Yes, I definitely agree. Uh, that's kind of all of the questions that I have. Um, if anyone has any more, you can throw it in really quick. Um, but I think that'll kind of close us out for today. Um, so I just wanted to say, Yakupi, Dr. Hansen, for joining us today and for all of this research that you did um, in collaboration with Choctaw Nation and for sharing um, all of um, about your work here today. I really appreciate it. Well, and I, as again, again, I appreciate the invitation and the collaboration, and I look forward to uh, being out there in Oklahoma with you guys again uh, one of these days in the hopefully not too distant future. And uh, um, so we'll see what happens. Yes, you'll definitely have to come out to the cultural center. Yes. They talk about Thomas Jefferson and his usage of debt. Good. All right. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, if you came in late, this is gonna this was recorded, and so we're gonna put it all up on the Choctaw Nation YouTube page so you can catch up on that beginning part. So Chipisalachiki, everyone. Bye.